All right, so as folks continue to log on and join us, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live with Christine Platt and Courtney Carver discussing the Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. You can follow the link posted in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, be sure to use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. Before we dive in, we do wanna take a moment to thank you out there for joining us. We are really grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It is my pleasure to introduce this incredible book. When Christine Platt set out on her journey to live with less, she never intended to become the Afro minimalist. She just wanted to tame the chaos in her closet. But after struggling with the austerity and whiteness of mainstream minimalism, Christine realized why minimalism often seems unattainable for so many. The emphasis on all white, barren aesthetics distracts from the practice of living with intention. And so she decided to do things her way by curating a life of less influenced by the African diaspora. In the Afro-Minimalist Guide to Living with Less, Christine gets right to the heart of how childhood experiences and expectations manifest in adulthood. The delicate dance between needs and wants and the complicated weight of familial and societal pressures. A far cry from conmarie closets, capsule wardrobes, and conspicuous consumption, Christine's brand of living with less is more than a decluttering regimen. Inspired by her personal journey, Christine presents a radical revisioning of minimalism, one that celebrates the importance of history and heritage and gives you permission to make space for what really matters your way. Christine Platt is a modern day Renaissance woman. From serving as an advocate for policy reform to using the power of storytelling as a tool for social change, Christine's work reflects her practice of living with intention. She holds a BA in Africana Studies, MA in African American Studies, and a JD in General Law. Christine has written over two dozen literary works for people of all ages. When she's not writing, Christine spends her time curating the Afro Minimalist, a creative platform chronicling her journey to minimalism. Platt will be in conversation with Courtney Carver, an author of three books, including Project 333 and Soulful Simplicity. She's also the creator of the simplicity blog, bemorewithless.com. She shares things that make her laugh and cry on Instagram and hosts a podcast called Soul and Wit with her daughter, Bailey. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Christine Platt and Courtney Carver. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you so much, Julia. Hi, Christine. Hi, everybody. Hi, how are you? It's so good to see you. Same to you. We have been trying to do an event together for well over a year, and I'm thrilled that we're here together today. And for everyone here, I mean, yes, this is going to be a, an incredible conversation and we're going to answer your questions, but I just want to remind everyone that this is also a, a really big celebration. This is the publication day of Christine's book, The Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. It's so pretty. I, I couldn't even fold over the pages, so I had to put paper in to like mark pages <laughs> I want to go back to. And the whole front cover is embossed and it just feels so nice in my hands. I'm thrilled to have it. Um, so you. Christine, congrats. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm so proud. I am just so proud of this book and it is, it is very beautiful. Um, and I'm just very grateful. You know, there was a lot that I pushed back on, um, you know, a lot of minimalism books are either, you know, like a white cover or cream. And I was like, no, it has to be bright. I need it to be the color of my jumpsuit. <laughs> and they were like, are you sure? And then when we got the proof, we were all like, oh, you know, so yeah, it's really special. Very special. Well, you. I, even though I know our conversation will 
flow quite easily. I did jot down some questions Sure. Mostly because I'm super curious and <laughs> want to know, but I'm sure everyone else will benefit from hearing this. And if you think of anything else that you want to add, of course, interject anytime. This is your night, your event, your book, and I'm really okay. just honored to be here. Um, so tell us a little bit about how this book came to be and maybe mm-hmm. some secrets of your writing process or routines. How this book came to be, Courtney, you know, I was just minding my little quarantine life last summer. Um, actually really grateful to have a moment to just slow down. You know, I was writing a lot of children's books and an Andrew series. Um, and it was just a really nice time to just, it was just perfect to be in quarantine. And then I get a call from my agent and she's like, I think you should write that Afro minimalist book. She was like, it just seems very timely right now. And I was like, you think so? And uh, yeah, we literally pitched it to one editor <laughs> and Hannah was perfect. And so, um, so that's how that started. Um, but I had no idea that I was only gonna have a few months to write it because of course it was timely. So we really wanted it to come out in June, I really wanted it to um, pub on Juneteenth, but as you know, all new books come out on, <laughs> on Tuesdays. Um, but June, having it come out in June was really important to me, not only for Juneteenth, but Essence Festival. Like, it's just the perfect time for me to really be in conversation um, with my community. Um, and so, yeah, I wrote this book in like six to eight months. Um, editorial process. And now here we are. It is unbelievable. Wait, so a year uh, from start to finish. Yeah. It hasn't even been a year. It hasn't Whoa. Even been a year. <laughs> but Courtney, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, you and I have been in conversation many times on your podcast, just chatting and um, you know, so much of this was already in me. Right. And so it just gave me an opportunity um, to really, to really get it out. And I'd always said, I really wanted to move these conversations beyond the squares on Instagram, right? Because you remember when our minimalist community started, it was literally just like a handful of people. We all knew each other. We all followed each other. And then all of a sudden our community just grew. Um, and I just really wanted a way to, to get this message out to more and more people. And so even though I had a short window of time, um, I think that's probably for the best, right? It forced me to just, just get it out. And, and now it's a whole book. (laughs) It's amazing. So tell us about the writing process. You had a short amount of time. And in my experience, no matter how much time they give you, that's how much time you take. (laughs) So (laughs) how, how did you write the book and did you have any like specific process or routines to help you get motivated to write? Yeah. You know, I think uh, there were a few professions during uh, the pandemic that, that sort of lended themselves to be, I don't know, beneficial (laughs) to being in quarantine. Um, Writers were used to being in isolation, right? Um, Although it was a little too much isolation (laughs) for me. And so I ended up getting an office space at Eaton Workshop DC. Um, I actually thanked them in the acknowledgements because I basically lived there um, uh, for part of the pandemic. Um, And so, yeah, I would just go into my office space every morning. Um, There were a few other writers who were there as well. And we just had this little community. We all had deadlines and um, it was really nice because we still had our separate offices, but we were still able to be in community. And then of course we had like all the restaurants and amenities to ourselves. I mean, it was actually like a writer's dream. Um, And I think, you know, in terms of like getting things just done and on the page, I mean, there is like no trick to it. I tell people all the time, like you just have to write, right? And I have committed to writing every day, right? And so my body was already in this habit and routine of doing that. it was, it was, I'm not going to say like, it was easy though. <laughs> it was, it was very challenging at times. Um, and this was my first time working with a really big publisher. Uh, Anna and Andrew was the very small independent uh, educational press. And so, 
yeah, the deadlines were different. The demands were different. The lingo was different. I was like, what do you mean first pass? How many (laughs) passes do we get? You know, like that sort of thing. Um, But yeah, I learned a lot. I had an amazing editor and it was just, it's just a beautiful process. And um, I think being at Eaton, being around other writers um, who were also just trying to like get their work out, it really helped. It really helped a lot. And, you know, my daughter was here playing violin all day, so... (laughs) I kind of didn't have a choice. <laughs> it does help to have a change of scenery, I think, yeah. sometimes as well. And, you know, I love my bed, so I had to, <laughs> I had to get out. <laughs> yeah, I definitely. Bed. Yeah. Um, so aside from your personal story, there is one thing that allows this book to really stand out in the minimalism slash simplicity space. Mm-hmm. And that is your attention to cultural considerations. You have made that a main focus with pages throughout the book called For the Culture. Yes. Tell us more about your intention with this and, and, and just go a little deeper so people understand. It was really like all new information to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was super intentional. I mean, for me, the For the Culture pages are just, first of all, I never expected them to be like this beautiful, right? The whole book is (laughs) gorgeous. Because I like looked at a Word document for so long. And I remember when I finally, I was like, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. But I specifically asked that these for the culture call out pages, like really stand out. Um, And just having them on a separate black page is just beautiful. Um, But my intention was to really address some of the challenges that marginalized communities face when it comes to simplicity and living with less and why so many people feel like this is a lifestyle that is unattainable for them, right? Um, There are historical considerations. I mean, there's just so many things that we have to consider as a community um, before, you know, letting go, right? Um, And so I wanna read uh, one of my favorite pages for the culture um, call out pages. Ownership is an especially complicated matter for people of the African diaspora. From our ancestors being stolen and once owned as property to our need to have things so that we feel in control of something in our lives, black people have a different, deeper relationship with our belongings. Additionally, our communities are still grappling with generational implications and inequities resulting from slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, and other state-sanctioned limitations on ownership. Without a doubt, our familial and collective histories continue to influence why we are so attached to our things. Black people and other marginalized groups must understand the powerful connection between the psychology of ownership and the false sense of security it often provides. Our desire to seek comfort in things is heightened when we live in a society where we constantly feel unsafe, at risk. Take special note of areas in your life where your attachments to and unwillingness to let go of certain things may be rooted less in the culture of consumerism and more in the culture of white supremacy. Although making such acknowledgments can be difficult and even painful, this work is necessary not only for your minimalist practice, but also for your survival and that of our communities. If our resources are used to purchase things for comfort instead of building generational wealth, we run the risk of not only remaining victims of systemic oppression, but even worse, contributing to it. Oh, even reading that aloud is heavy, right? (laughs) But it's true, so like, you know, to think that you can, you know, talk to every group and population the same is just ridiculous when it comes to any lifestyle, um, you know? And so I think really getting to the heart of my community and other communities um, that are, you know, other marginalized communities, because we just have a different complicated matter uh, um, 
we just have different complicated, I should say, matters with our belongings, right? Um, and even this idea, you know, sometimes the advice is, okay, go into your house and throw away everything. <laughs> People are like, what? <laughs> right? And so really getting people to understand some of the things that we carry with us historically, right? Some of the things that our grandparents may have told us, our great grandparents may have told us that was wise and advisable in their day, but in our day is really no longer applicable or may need some tweaks, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I know one of the things that we talked about a lot were the statistics, right? So that was the other thing. I really wanted my community to see the statistics of our buying power, right? I mean, it's so, I was shocked. I mean, a lot of this I learned writing the book, you know, and I'm just like, wow. I was too. And not only the spending from marginalized communities, but the way that they are marketed to. The targeted marketing. Isn't that wild? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was really the purpose for me um, with those pages. And like I said, you know, in each section, each page really just addresses, um, you know, black and marginalized communities. Um, so be on the same topic, right, of whatever's being mentioned in that section. But here's some additional considerations. And like I said in the book, of course, this speaks directly to my community, but it's really for all of us to, to learn and be educated about consumerism, about targeted marketing, right? Like, all of these generational inequities are things that affect us all, right? And so if we all know, <laughs> now there's an opportunity for you to do something different, right? Um, and so I really love that they have been so, um, that they have just been so welcomed into this conversation and into this space. As you know, I've joked with you before, this is like a predominantly white space, li literally. And Not a joke. <laughs> Not a joke. <laughs> right. And so it's been wonderful, though, for me to see um, so many people being open, you know, not just my community, but so many people being open to a different approach um, to minimalism. Right. Or I shouldn't even say approach. I should say a different consideration, because I think that we can take bits and pieces um, from everyone, you know, like I con Mari my closet. I'm not against Marie Kondo. You yeah. know, I have a capsule wardrobe. Right. But there's so many more things. Um, to consider beyond that. And so that's what I really, really hope that I got to the heart of in this book. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just important. And mm -hmm. I've since read it, your book twice, and I'm starting a third time because I'm still just trying to absorb a lot of the information that only because it's nothing that I had considered before. And I'm grateful for it. It's important Thanks. stuff. So Thank you. Just would encourage everyone to, to take a look. Um, you wrote about how attachment to things starts in childhood. And you and I have had several conversations around this, but you illustrate this really well with a story about dish soap. And I'm wondering if you would share this story and talk more about the childhood connection. Yes. So one of the things that was so important for me with this book is like, I didn't want us to jump right into letting go because so many books, are, you know, it's like, hi, welcome. Okay. Let's go to your closet. Right. And I'm like there was so much that I wish I had known before I started the process. Um, and that's why, you know, starting with like, seriously, why do I have so much stuff? Like I just, let's get to the root cause of that. Right. And I only look at a couple of, um, you know, factors, but one of the main factors is, is started in our childhood. Right. So I really want folks to do this self-discovery of understanding their spending habits. Right. And their spending behaviors. And we ask some questions about, you know, did you receive an allowance? Did you have to earn it? Right. Like, how did your family celebrate achievements and milestones? Um, and so getting people sometimes to get people to understand. I love telling this story about my friend. Um, whose husband loves to use a lot of dish soap when he does dishes. Because um, I want you to understand just how deeply our childhood um, behaviors are, are rooted in us. Um, and so uh, he loves, loves using a lot of dish soap when he washes dishes. And his wife complained to me one day, she's one of my dear friends. She said, I just hate that he uses so much dish soap all the time. 
And I'm like, he's washing the dishes. It's fine. She's like, no, it's actually really annoying. Like the bubbles are overflowing out of the sink. And I said, well, have you ever asked him why? Uh, and she ended up asking him why. And the reason was he grew up in the South, very poor, was raised by his grandmother. Um, they always had to buy like dollar soap, uh, dollar store dish soap. And even then he could only use like a drop or two. And so now that he's older and wealthy and accomplished, he buys the most expensive dish soap that he can get. And he uses as much as he wants and he gets to see all the bubbles that he didn't get to, to experience in childhood. Right. Isn't that so like a great story. Ah, but it, you know, we all have things, um, you know, that, that we hold on to from our childhood. And we all have things that we, you know, we say, man, when I grow up, I'm gonna, you know, and that stays in us, right. And can manifest itself either in a closet full of sneakers. You know, I shared Joe's story in the book, you know, uh, a lot of kids could not, their parents maybe couldn't afford name brand sneakers when they were younger. They may have gotten teased and ridiculed. And now that they're older, they have an excessive amount of, you know, expensive sneakers, right? Um, and so really getting people to understand, you know, how our childhood plays a part, um, societal expectations, cultural expectations, right? Conspicuous consumption, um, which is a big one, and mindless consumption, right? Like mindless consumption for me, and even though I know this, I'm, I'm writing about it during the pandemic, I clicked on one too many Instagram ads, <laughs> Courtney, just one too many. And I remember that post that I did at the end of last year where I was holding up my little, um, my little Apple watch holder. Do you remember, do you remember that? I post? think I do. I was, definitely do. And I, I just said, you guys, let's close out the year. Let's just all share our most ridiculous pandemic purchase. And there were just like hundreds and hundreds of comments. And it was so funny. The number of people who brought weighted hula hoops, the number of people who <laughs> purchased, you know, two pound bags of flour and someone else had yeast and they were like, let's get together and make bread, right? Like the thing is we, once you know what your triggers are, you know, how you form attachments to things, why you buy things, you just recognize those things a little bit more um, in times of heightened, you know, insecurity or, you know, issues like the pandemic. And it doesn't mean that you won't buy a single thing, but it means that, okay, I know what this is. I'm feeling it. I mean, Aww. just recognizing that yeah. is so important because we, if you think back to the very beginning of the pandemic, when we were all buying toilet paper, like what? We just, we want, we needed that. We, yeah. We saw security. security, safety, comfort, knowing that it couldn't heal us or help us really in almost no. any way, but we were just like, what, what can we do? This is what I we know. can do. I know. And it happens all the time. And I tell people, you know, like look beyond just like the obvious, right? Like maybe your closet is overflowing. Right. But look beyond that. Right. Like you know, if you grew up with food scarcity as a child, there chances are your pantry will be stacked with things that you, you may never have enough time <laughs> to eat them, but there's some sort of comforting feeling about opening your pantry and seeing it full because you remember opening it and seeing it not full and how that, you know? And so I yeah. think like, that's why in the first part of the book, like talking about motivations, why we're motivated to purchase certain things and then how we form attachments to them is so powerful, right? Um, doing that before the letting go process also allows you to look at the items that you're struggling to let go of <laughs> a little differently, right? Like it's not just the shirt, then it's like, it's the shirt that I purchased for the event because I didn't want people to see me in the same shirt again, right? Oh, this is a form of conspicuous consumption. So I think it's so important just to get to those root causes of, you know, why we have more than we need and understand why it's so hard to let go. Yeah. I used to do this thing <clears throat> where I'd say, oh, I'm so bored with my wardrobe or I'm really frustrated with my clothes. Mm -hmm. And then I would buy more stuff. And then I would go through that process. I'd be bored again in like <clears throat> five minutes. <clears throat> and I was thinking like, what is really going on? Which I could yeah. never get to those questions until 
I stopped shopping and then had that space to say, are you bored with your wardrobe or are you bored with your work or your life or your whatever? Yeah. Um, It's pretty interesting stuff. Tell us about your four step process or formula, because I don't think we do number one or two nearly enough. We just don't. And they're like two of the most important steps. (laughs) Um, I'm very proud of this process, Courtney, because it's the process that I wish I had had when I, you know, started, I started like most people, you know, like what I saw on the internet, pulling stuff out my closet and being like, oh my God, I thought I could do this in a weekend. How do they do this in a weekend on TV? You know, and just like three years, (laughs) years, you know? Um, So step one is acknowledgement, right? Like acknowledging that you have more than you need. And acknowledgement is going beyond you calling up your girlfriend and being like, oh, I have so much stuff in my closet, right? Acknowledgement is like, let me take some inventory and like really see what I have. And in the book, I share um, one of the inventory lists that I made from one of the closets that I had (laughs) in my house back then. And um, I mean, I had no idea that I had over 50 pairs of jeans. I had no idea. I only wore the same two pair, but I was a bargain shopper who was in love with the thrill of the hunt, right? So what happens during that acknowledgement process is you start to see little signs. And for me, there were a lot of tags still attached to things. And they like all had these red, you know, clearance labels on them. You know, they position them just right. So you can like see just how much of a deal you're getting. (laughs) And so I realized like, wow, I love finding stuff on sale. But then once I get it home, it's like, yeah, you know? And um, so for me, that acknowledgement process really allowed me to see not only, you know, that I had way too much stuff, but also the main reason why, which was like, I was a bargain shopper, um, not being intentional with my purpose purchases, just really, you know, wanting to find a deal. And, you know, that's how I came up with my mantra. It's not a deal if you don't need it. I love that. (laughs) Which I have to like tell myself sometimes when I'm in the store. And then step two is super important um, because it's forgiving yourself and forgiving others, right? So one of the things that also isn't addressed, um, I feel in the mainstream minimalism space are all of the emotions that you you experience when you go through this process, right? Um, You know, you're looking at piles of things that you haven't worn and you may feel guilty. You may feel angry. I cried. I mean, I sobbed thinking about like how much money I wasted. I was so angry at myself. And I just had like all these competing emotions and it was awful. And I was just like, I have got to forgive myself. If I do not forgive myself, I'm never going to be able to move beyond this space of, you know, like I'm gonna stay stuck with an acknowledgement and what am I gonna do, right? And so um, forgiveness is a big, is a big part of it. And um, sorry, I live right near Andrews Air Force Base. So you're probably hearing a helicopter flying over. Um, I remember. I can't hear it. Really? That's so wild. It's like, I feel like they're about to come through my my window. Anyway. (laughs) um, So I remember talking to um, my editor about this section, this forgive yourself section. And she just kept pushing back, pushing back. And she said, Christina, I just think you need to write like a forgiveness prayer. Okay, let me just pause here. You know, when you're in the middle of writing your book, the idea of having to do anything extra, (laughs) what you've already set out to do. I'm just like, oh, Hannah, do you really think they need a forgiveness prayer? Like, can I just, she's like, no, like they need that. And I remember writing this out and at the end, I just sobbed. So hopefully I won't sob today, but I'm gonna read the forgiveness prayer that is in here. As I commit to my journey to live with less, I acknowledge that I have more than I need and forgive myself for the choices that have led to my excess. I also forgive others who have knowingly or unknowingly contributed to my behaviors and spending habits and I release any and all negativity that I may be harboring as a result of their influence. 
I have a right to experience everything that I am feeling. So I allow myself to acknowledge these feelings, but I refuse to let them hold me captive and bound to my past. As I continue to do the work to live with less, whenever I feel negative emotions, I will acknowledge them. Excuse me, I will acknowledge them and then I will release them. And I will repeat this process as many times and as often as necessary because I am worthy of and capable of forgiveness. And with this extension of grace to myself and others comes the power to move forward in confidence with my decision to become a more mindful, intentional consumer. I commit to doing so not only for myself, but also for the people and community I love. Now I move forward with renewed purpose and gratitude for the gift of forgiveness. I oh my say. gosh. Is anyone crying? <laughs> I'm not crying. You know, but like, it's so powerful um, because so much guilt is wrapped in the decluttering process, right? So much guilt. Um, there's so much guilt. And I, I'm like, we have to forgive ourselves, right? Like, and I've, I've learned to stop saying mistakes. Like you didn't make a mistake. You had some experiences. Now you have learned from these experiences, forgive yourself and move on. Right. Like, so like even language matters, I try not to say like, oh, I'm purging, you know, like I'm letting go. Right. Like certain language triggers and evokes certain emotions and thoughts. Right. Um, so yeah, forgiveness of yourself and others is really important to me. That's step two. Step three is what people uh, thought they were buying the book for before they realized they were about to do a whole process of self-discovery. <laughs> um, but step, step three is letting go, right? And letting go um, again with intention, right? Um, do I need this? Do I use this? Do I love this? Usually we meet one of the elements. Usually we love something. Oh my God. Courtney, I love this glass so much. My mom gave it to me, did it, you know? And it's like, but do you really need that glass? Do you really use that <laughs> glass? You know? <laughs> do you need um, another so coffee cup? Oh my God. Don't start me with the coffee cups. <laughs> I think they like somehow magically uh, reproduce and multiply in my, in my cupboard. Um, For sure. You know, but no, like really understanding, you know, do I really need this? Do I use it? And do I love it? And for me, if all three of those elements are not met, I let it go. Now, caveat, because we are human <laughs> and we can justify anything <laughs> if we want something, right? It's like, again, this is self-accountability, right? And I tell people, if you find yourself like really struggling or grappling with something, like just put it aside for now. It's not, there is no rush there's no competition. There's actually no finish line. <laughs> so this is like a journey that you're going to be on for a while. So to rush and let go of something um, is just crazy. You know, like just take your time. Some stuff will be easier to let go of than others. Um, you know, there's also a lot of considerations to take in there as well. There's cultural considerations. There's what I like to call inherited clutter you know, from, from family. Right. And so it may take some time to work through those things. Um, and it's definitely not something that is going to be done in a weekend. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you think it's not happening in a weekend. Okay. And then step four is paying it forward. And that is, you know, again, being intentional about what you do with your donations. One of, I guess, the most shocking things to me um, in doing research was just how much stuff ends up in landfills. Like, oh my gosh, like F waste for our furniture, right? Like it's clothing. It's, I, I was just like, it's so much stuff. Um, and there's so many ways that we can pay it forward with things that no longer serve us that are still in great condition and can serve other people. Um, and even some things that you think, no one's going to want this, right? Like artist, right? Um, ceramic tiles, Habitat for Humanity. Like there's, all, you know, people are like, oh, I have leftover construction materials. There is someone who will take that, you know? Um, I'm a really big fan of buy nothing groups. Um, that is like my new 
jam that I like to tell people, find your local buy nothing group. Um, and that way you're paying it forward um, by helping your community directly, you know, get to meet some really cool people as well. Um, and then, yeah, just like making sure that when you are making your donation that you're actually benefiting the organization and not hindering them. Um, you're not helping an organization by giving them something that they don't need either for their clients or something that they can't sell, you know? So that's really the pay it forward um, piece for me. And I have found, you know, if you can find an organization that aligns with a mission, something that you believe in, it makes it much easier to let go of things. Um, if you have a great buy nothing group, it's much easier to let go of things, right? So there, there's also that process in there too, um, with paying it forward is like, let me find out who can really benefit um, from, from what no longer serves me. How can I use this to serve someone else? You know. So that's my four-step approach, my holistic four-step approach to decluttering. Um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just want to remind everyone that I am going to take questions for Christine. If you want to pop them in the Q and a section and I'm just looking through, I've been peeking at all the comments and everybody is really excited about the book. Um, <laughs> uh, Simone said real tears over here oh. after your prayer and just a lot of acknowledgement and connection around the cultural component and focus and how important that is. Uh, before, go ahead and pop your questions into the Q&A for Christine. And I have one more question around okay. gift giving, because I get this question a lot from people like, yes. how do I tell people I don't want more stuff? And how can I become a more intentional gift giver? And I know yeah. you have a section in here. I think it's called gift with care yes. or gift with right? intention. I okay. Think. So yeah. tell <laughs> us what your thoughts are on the gift scene. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I could talk about gifts forever. So I'm really glad you mentioned this. So many things in our home are things that we don't need use and love, but we just felt bad about telling the giver that we didn't want it right? And what happens is when you bring those things into your house, it's a different type of attachment. It's a type of attachment where you feel responsible for what you took in. So that makes it even harder um, to let go. So first of all, one of the most powerful tools in your arsenal as a minimalist is the word no. Actually, no thank you is nicer, right? Um, <laughs> and so getting people um, you know, to say no, thank you is very powerful and empowering, right? Um, I don't no thank you. I don't need the free gift for the purchase. This is beautiful, but no, thank you. I don't have space in my closet. This is a beautiful coffee cup. Thank you. You know, I love coffee. Thank you so much for thinking of me. However, I literally do not need another coffee cup, right? Like, there are ways you can say it without being mean. Um, and saying no is not being mean, it's setting boundaries, <laughs> right? Um, so you can stay committed and focused um, to, to your new goal of living with less. In terms of being a more um, intentional gift giver, um, I love gifting people with things that disappear, right? And so I think that's the other thing people feel like, oh, if you're a minimalist, you can't give gifts or you don't uh, receive certain, my friends know, right? Because they've heard that no enough times that now they know, right? And that's what will happen. The more you are firm um, in what you will accept and will not accept, all of a sudden you'll start getting messages that are like, hey, I saw this X, Y, and Z, but I know you're on your little journey to minimalism. So do you want it? You know, like that kind of thing. Um, and so my friends know to uh, gift me things that disappear that can, and I do the same, that can be um, food items, that can be incense, that can be soap, it can be candles, you know, it's a really um, fun way to be creative, I think, as well with your gift giving. Um, you know, if there are, if there's a family that you're gifting to, I mean, it could be meals, right? Like I often think about like things like baby clothes, right? Like this is a family, 
they already have hand-me-down baby clothes that they're, that they're going to use. You giving them another set of onesies is like just not really helpful. Maybe you can gift them, you know, dinner one night, you know, or something. But there are just ways that you can be, um, I think, super creative. There are also really wonderful organizations out there. One of the best gifts I ever received, Courtney, was I opened up this email and it said, congratulations, you have gifted um, a cow via Heifer International. And it told me all about the community that it was serving, how it was gonna benefit this. It was like so wonderful. And someone had gifted a cow in my honor, right? So I feel like there's so many different ways to be creative beyond running into our you know, usual stores. I'm not gonna name any names, <laughs> but like, let me just run in here real quick and get a gift card and something over here and go, right? Like be super intentional um, about it. Um, and, you know, I'm always thinking, is this going to add to someone else's clutter? Is this going to add to, you know, someone else being overwhelmed? Um, and so, yeah, those are my, like my, my gift. That's amazing. <laughs> um, Gaynell suggested in the chat chocolate and I support I that. Always like, or cookies, like who is going to be like, no, I actually don't want these cookies. You know what I mean? <laughs> like there's, and, and you know, you know, generally, you know, the people who you're gifting really well, you know, like, you know, whether to get them chocolate chip cookies or oatmeal raisin cookies, right? Like, and to know that that will be so much more appreciated than some random trinket that you thought was really nice that they might like. And they're like, great. And now they're responsible for it. Exactly. And they feel guilty for letting it. We're just continuing the cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Let's jump into some questions. Are you ready? Uh, I, I am ready. Okay. Uh, and as we get closer to time, so we've got about 13 minutes, but as we get closer oh, wow. to time, I'm going to ask you to speed up and do some rapid fire if that happens. Okay. But right. for now, let's start with um, Daphne's question. How do you feel about saving clothes for your children? So like, say, I think um, she means like saving your own clothes for when your kids grow up. You know, it's so interesting. This came up the other day um, as well with someone. Her daughter was actually old enough, though, to I was like, why don't you just ask them if they think they might like this in the future? Um, I mean, I, I think it's OK. Um, I think that there has to be a very meaningful reason behind it. Um, and I think that it also requires some self-inquiry of whether you are holding this for yourself for some reason, right? And this idea that, oh, my child will, may want this in the future is really just part of this attachment that you have to this thing, because this is what I was talking about earlier, right? Like we can justify anything, right? Like we can say, actually, you know, this glass in the future might be vintage and it might be, you know, and it's just like, I'm not big on future use, right? Because future use is one of like the root causes of hoarding mm. and the future is not promised, right? And I think, you know, as a parent, one of the things that we have to think about the most is that inherited clutter piece, right? There are so many people who I've talked to that inherited clutter and they didn't know what to do. What do you do? How do you throw out grandma's things? How do you throw out your, you know what I'm saying? And so yeah. just keeping all of those things in mind, um, but yeah, I would, I would get to, I would dig a little deeper to see like, why do I think my child would want this in the future? Right. Like, I mean, as the mom of a 25 year old, I can say that if, whenever I mention that, she just gives me this look like, Please they don't, don't do this to me. <laughs> they don't want it, you know? Um, and I mean, I've seen it with my own daughter. There were things that I'm like, oh, she's going to love this. And she's like, I'm like, do you want it? No. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I would just dig a little deeper because sometimes yeah. we do justify our attachments, you know, with other things. So uh, Emily wants to know, she says, I love the color organized books behind you. How do you deal with a book habit? And what are your thoughts on eBooks? I love, actually love eBooks and audiobooks. Um, a lot of the books that I have behind me are very special to me, like my Octavia Butler collection, never going anywhere. Um, also some of my friends, you know, their books are back there. 
um, you know, I'm a writer and a historian, and so I'm never going to be without books, right? How do I find ways to be organized with my books? You know, yes, use them as art or like a statement piece. Yes. Um, but I'm never going to stop buying books. and I'm never going to stop reading, right? Um, I think it's super important, though, that if this is a, an issue for you, that you do find ways um, to be more mindful about which books you have as physical books and which books that you can have in some other format that limits the amount of space that it's taking up in your home, right? So maybe some, you know, like my friend Tia just came out with a book, Seven Days in June, which is amazing ebook. I want to take it to the beach. I want to, you know, but if it's like Clint's book, you know, how the word is passed, which is like based on, you know, history, that's a book that I want in physical form because it's something that I will continue to return to time and time again. You see what I'm saying? So sure. you just have to be mindful when it comes, um, when it comes to those things where you have another option. Um, paper is another one, but we don't have enough time here. <laughs> well, let me, I have more questions for you. So Lisa okay. wants to know, have you ever considered an Afro minimalist podcast? It would be so amazing. <laughs> I have considered an Afro minimalist podcast um, and I may have one in the future for now. I'm just like on a lot of other people's podcasts, um, you know, time is, is very important to me and being very intentional with my time. Um, but I have, you know, I have a few little things in the work, so stay tuned for that. Stay I mean, tuned. that sounded like a yes to me, but we'll <laughs> see. Uh, Tessa asks, at what moment did you realize you were a minimalist or was there a moment that Hmm. You know, I don't think there was ever like a defining moment. I think I was a minimalist before my house was minimized, right? Like, I feel like I made that commitment. I'm going to be a minimalist. And I just felt like I was <laughs> in that moment. I just knew that I had a lot of stuff to let go of. Um, but, you know, in, in retrospect, it's like, I don't even know if I would have used that word. I mean, I don't know how Afro intentionalist sounds or, you know, like, <laughs> But it's really, it's, it's so much more than things, right? It's just really being a mindful, intentional consumer. Like, you just want to be a more conscious consumer, right? Um, and so I really don't like to get caught up in, in the title of that and the definition and what does it mean? And, you know, I'm always like, define it for you. Minimalism for me looks like Afro minimalism, right? But for someone else, it is going to be entirely different, right? Because it should, your practice should be rooted in your own authenticity and, you know, grounded in intention, right? And it doesn't mean that you may end up having 500 things, right? I'm not a big fan of counting your things either, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, like you will get to a point where you know, okay, this, this feels good. This feels good for me. And for me, it took me five years. Yeah. yeah, we don't have enough time, but we've had plenty of discussions on labels and how really it doesn't matter what you call it. I mean, I'm sure people have asked you what's the difference between simplicity and minimalism. Yeah. It just doesn't matter. It's more important what you do with it versus what you call it. Absolutely. Um, so if it's helpful to put a, a name to it, great. But otherwise, don't worry. Yeah, for sure. Um, what is the most challenging aspect of minimalism for you? Um, I think at this point, I don't really have any challenges in that way. I mean, I know uh, where my week, I know what my weaknesses are, right? I have my mantra, you know, not a deal if I don't need it. You know, my, I have a new one too, Courtney. I don't think I told you this one, which is <laughs> Christine, what's the why behind the buy? This is my new thing. <laughs> why are you buying this? <laughs> right. Um, and so I think, you know, the biggest thing for me was bargain shopping and I just don't do that anymore. Am I tempted? Obviously I see a sale rack and my eyes are like, let's go. Right. But now, and I talk about some of this in the book, right? Like once you know what your triggers are, what your spending habits and behaviors are, how they were formed, you know, how you form attachments. I'm, I'm very different at the sales rack now. You know, I am not, um, not touching a lot of stuff because I understand the power of touch, <laughs> right? Um, we talk about that in the book, partial ownership, yes, <laughs> right? Um, 
I'm not touching a lot of stuff. And if I do pick up something and I, you know, I see it's beautiful, it's Christine, do you need this? Are you really going to use this? Right. Most of the time we've just seen something that's very pretty and we we've held it for too long <laughs> and then we want to own it, you know? Um, so yeah, I think I've, you know, worked through a lot of those, those challenges, which is why I couldn't have written this book three years ago or two years ago, right? Like, I feel like I'm in a good place now where I can actually serve as a guide and help other people because I've been able to work through so much of that, you know? Sure. Uh, Tessa wants to know what is the most important idea you'd like people to take away from the book? The most important, I, I really want people to understand that what, as you said, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> that you can live a life with less and that you should live a life with less. I mean, it not only benefits you individually, but it also benefits us collectively, especially the environment, right? There's so much waste. We, we don't even have time for fast fashion conversations, right? But like, there's so much waste. Um, and so I think the one takeaway is that I really want people to understand that you can live with less if you do it your way. You cannot look at the aesthetics of mainstream minimalism and you know this whole, I need to have an all white house and it needs to be barren and I need, I have to have Scandinavian furniture. And like, that is not minimalism at its core. And like, I don't know any, I don't know how that became the face of minimalism because no minimalist I know has the, like, we have color, we have, you know, different things, but for some reason, um, you know, mainstream minimalism is obsessed with these beautiful, serene spaces. And I too, that is what lured me into the practice originally. Um, and then found out very quickly, like, oh, this looks beautiful on Pinterest, but actually feels quite sterile in here. I don't think this is going to work out for me. Right. So the takeaway is you can live with less if you do it your way. Love that. Love that. Uh, Carmen says, love your intention. What's your recommendation for creating a minimalist community for people of the African diaspora? I am already here creating this community. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are so like, I think the one beautiful thing about Instagram, and I'm so grateful that so many of us met Courtney, like before we were had these large, massive followings is that we were able to really connect um, with other minimalists. And I remember the first time I saw another black minimalist, I was like, oh my God, Yolanda, you're a black minimalist too, right? And she was like, yes. And we have a group over here. And we, and like, there's so many, I try to highlight um, a lot of the um, diverse voices, like in my, I do these IG stories and less is liberation conversations, but the community is there, right? Um, I also think this, this book is an opportunity for you to read with family, read with friends, right? Because so much of it is, is going to be generational um, and to have these conversations. I mean, you can start, I always say start at home, even <laughs> with my anti-racism work, right? Everything is start at home and build and branch out. Um, and so that would be my recommendation. Of course, you can always join me online um, at, at Afro Minimalist. We have a, a lovely Instagram community. People share so many wonderful tips and advice. Um, and so, yeah, that would be my that would be my advice, Courtney. You could also start a book club on Instagram I around could. this book. Not in maybe it's not you because I think you have other things going on. <laughs> But the person who asked the question, they could start it. And yes, be... Carmen, start the book club. I'll, I'll so. come visit. I, will, I would love to visit a book okay, club. Okay, rapid fire. We have one and a half Ooh. minutes left. So Simone okay. says, so you said we pitching Netflix for a show when? <laughs> Tomorrow. Not today. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow. Uh, and then I hope I say your name right. Yukari says, Yukari. who should we be following who are doing, who should we be following who are doing this work their own way? Oh, just go through my, um, who followers. you're following. Yes. Who I'm following on Instagram and we're all doing it. There's at least 2000 people there. So love that. And Lisa, I think we got your question already with the books <laughs> earlier. Um, we did it, Christine. We Congratulations again. I'm Thank really, you. this is amazing. And thanks everybody for showing up. 
Yes, thank you all so much. Hope we you enjoyed hear- reading. Oh. No, you're fine. <laughs> and of course, we here at Politics and Prose really want to thank you, Christine Platt and Courtney Carver. We do have one bonus question we like to ask oh. all of our authors and speakers. And okay. that is, besides this fantastic book, what is currently on your bedside table or something that's been brewing in your head that you'd like to recommend? Fiction, nonfiction, whatever genre, what are you reading currently? You know, having a gratitude journal. Um, I have a gratitude journal by the side of my bed and it has become such a wonderful practice for me either to like at the end of the day, just write down all of the things that I want to look back on and be happy about and proud of. And then also when I'm having a tough day to like flip through some of the earlier entries and just be like, I have so much to be happy for. And so that is like my new recommendation for people, gratitude journal. Thanks. Courtney. Courtney. I am reading a lot of fiction right now. Um, So I just finished a book called The Last Thing He Told Me. And I can't remember (laughs) the author's name, but woo, that was a good one. Um, Definitely dipping into some thrillers, uh, not gory thrillers, just nice, like surprising thrillers. (laughs) Uh, And then... Anything by the author Taylor Jenkins Reid. So mm-hmm. she wrote Daisy Jones and the Six. That was amazing. Mm-hmm. And uh, what is the name of the book that I'm listening to on Audible right now? It is The Seven Husbands of Elizabeth Hugo, I believe. Ooh. So yeah, all fiction. I'm escaping, enjoying. So fun. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> And of course, the kind folks at Politics and Prose would want me to encourage everyone to go check our website for those books as well, and gratitude journals, which we sell plenty of. Um, again, our thanks to Christine Platt, Courtney Carver, Thank you. and our audience out there tuning in with all these amazing responses and your questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this incredible programming, and we couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So go ahead and follow the link in the chat to purchase your guide um, or your copy of the Afro-Minimalist Guide to Living with Less, or just visit politics-pros.com. And while you're there, you can look at our events calendar for everything else we've got coming up in June and beyond. It'll be a great escape this summer for sure. (laughs) And from our shelves to yours, we hope you are out there staying strong, staying safe, and of course, staying well-read. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.